With almost plotting regularity, B-17 Flying Fortresses went to war powered by Wright R-1820 radial engines. It was a good fit and served the B-17 well, but the Fortress airframe dallied with a variety of other power plants in sometimes radical modifications. The original Model 299 prototype established itself as a contender in 1935 with Pratt & Whitney R1690 Hornet 9-cylinder radial engines developing 750 horsepower. All follow-on B-17s, starting with 13 service test Y-1 B-17s, were propelled by Wright R1820 Cyclone variants that grew from 920 to 1200 horsepower before combat models made that the norm. In 1942, Lockheed had access to an early B-17E during the process of establishing a Lockheed Vega assembly line for building B-17s under contract. Negotiations with the Army Air Forces that year resulted in a contract to modify this B-17E by replacing its radial rights with four liquid-cooled Allison V-1710-89 engines. The swap promised an increase of about 200 horsepower per engine. The modified B-17E airframe received an entirely new alphanumeric designation as the XB-38. It carried a dummy Sperry Ball turret in place of the smaller remote turret it had as an early B-17E. This was done to make airframe drag more commensurate with that of a current production B-17 for evaluation purposes. The liquid-cooled fortress first flew on May 19, 1943. The XB-38 promised a cruise speed more than 25 miles an hour faster than the standard B-17F, but the Allisons gave the XB-38 a lower service ceiling at only 29,600 feet. Testing with the Lockheed crew was far from finished when, on June 16, 1943, the number 3 Allison engine caught fire and would not be extinguished. As flames threatened to reach wing gas tanks, the two-man crew bailed out at 25,000 feet over California's San Joaquin Valley. The unmanned XB-38 came to Earth near Tipton, California. Pilot George McDonald died when his parachute failed to open. Pilot Bud Martin survived with injuries. The XB-38 project might have led to a further hybridization, an Allison-powered gunship derivative of the experimental B-40 that was also expected to have a bombing capability, unlike the original B-40s tested over Europe. But disappointing results with gunships dampened enthusiasm for an Allison B-40. Assurances of a steady supply of Wright R1820 radial engines lessened the requirement for an alternate power plant for the Flying Fortress. And at least six fighters in development or production in 1943 relied on the Allison V1710. The XB-38 project died with the crash of the aircraft. It is emblematic of the many hurry-up ideas created, especially early in the war, when not enough time had elapsed to give total confidence in the unfolding production and combat scenario. An entrepreneurial air tanker company, Aeroflight, took a fresh look at re-engining the B-17 in 1970. Stripping four Rolls-Royce Dart turboprop engines from a Viscount airliner and applying them to B-17FN1340N, Tanker 34. The conversion placed the long Dart turboprops far forward of the propeller line of a standard B-17.
Aeroflight had only a short time to fly its Turbine B-17. On August 18, 1970, the modified bomber crashed while fighting a fire in Wyoming. The NTSB called the mishap a stall mush accident, with the bomber hitting trees during the post-drop pull-up on a downslope downwind run. Sadly, the crew died in the crash. At war's end, the need for testbed aircraft that could carry new turbojet and turboprop engines aloft spawned a pair of B-17G conversions by Boeing, given the model designation 299Z. These B-17s kept all four R-1820 radial engines and incorporated a series of streamlined engine mounts in the nose to accommodate turboprops, advanced versions of the R-3350 piston engine, and even an underslung turbojet. In November 1947, Pratt & Whitney bought two B-17Gs from Air Force Surplus at Altus, Oklahoma. One became a spare parts source and the other, serial 4485734, -4 was ferried to Boeing in Seattle for modification. The work included moving the cockpit aft about four feet to accommodate large test engines in the nose. At Boeing's Wichita, Kansas plant, an Air Force-owned B-17 that was on bailment contract to Curtis Wright received similar modifications. The work on these test beds included adding structural members and thicker skin on some parts of the fuselage to take the loads expected to be imposed by the fifth engine in the nose. The beauty of the big B-17 engine test beds was their ability to take a test engine aloft with the safety margin of all four original engines intact. Publicists were fond of photographing the test beds in flight with all four R-1820s shut down, the only power keeping the plane aloft coming from the test bed turboprop in the nose. Curtis Wright made one unusual yet predictable change to their test bed B-17, replacing its regular Hamilton Standard propellers with Curtis Electric props and hubs. The Curtis Wright aircraft tested the Wright Typhoon XT-35 turbine engine originally envisioned for a Boeing bomber that became the B-52 with different engines. This test bed also flew with an underslung Curtis Wright J-65 turbojet. A nose-mounted T-49 prop jet variant of the J-65 was also flown. The T-49 turboprop was applied to the experimental Boeing XB-47D version of the Stratojet bomber. Curtis Wright bought the B-17 from the Air Force and flew tests including a turbo compound version of the R-3350 piston engine in which turbines used exhaust gases to produce hundreds of additional horsepower. Pratt & Whitney used the testbed B-17 for the T-34 turboprop engine. Originally of interest to the Navy, the T-34 ultimately found a home powering the Air Force Douglas C-133 transport instead. Placed in storage by the early 1960s, the Pratt & Whitney testbed was resurrected to test propellers for the Navy in 1965 and 1966. In 1967, the Pratt & Whitney 299Z was passed to the Connecticut Aeronautical Historical Association near Hartford. On outdoor static display, the 299Z featured an empty nose mount that still conveyed its special purpose as an engine test bed. Disaster struck on October 3, 1979, when a freak tornado touched down among the museum's parked aircraft and flung a Grumman Albatross onto the B-17. The museum divested itself of the wrecked fortress, and portions of it, along with parts of another B-17, went into the creation of the B-17G called Liberty Bell, which unfortunately suffered a forced landing and fire in 2011. The Curtis Wright 299Z was retired by the early 1960s, ultimately becoming part of Arnold Kolb's Black Hills Aviation Air Tanker Service in Spearfish, South Dakota. He ambitiously removed the foreshortened nose of the 299Z and spliced the stock B-17 nose back in place. Kolb's reconstituted B-17 air tanker, N6694C, served for years until a 1980 mishap in North Carolina burned the nose section. Parts of this B-17 were earmarked for other restorations. There's another lesser-known five-engine B-17 test bed made from B-17G44-85747. It retained its stock cockpit position and carried an XT-40 turboprop and later the T-56 turboprop, both from Allison. The melodious Wright Cyclone motors of a stock B-17 confirm their ability to power this classic bomber. 
but the airframe proved capable of adapting other engines for other purposes time and again. Thank you for watching the Aerial Images channel, and thank you especially for subscribing.